When we started Pier 26, this was just a giant concrete slab. It's a pier in Manhattan. Everything was unique. Anytime you work in New York City, they want 10 pounds of goods in a five pound bag. I'm in the Big Apple, home of some of the most recognizable landmarks in the world. New York City is known as the Concrete Jungle, which makes it easy to forget that it's actually surrounded by hundreds of miles of coastline. Lower Manhattan, that coastline is mostly inaccessible, but Hudson River Park is on a mission to change that. New York City became a powerful city because of its rivers. So industry grew up first along the river's edges, and the river edges became inaccessible to the public because of that. During the 1950s, 60s, 70s, shipping started declining, people started transporting their goods with airplanes, and the piers started becoming abandoned. I like to tell people I was born, bred, and buttered uh, right here in the concrete jungle. You know, growing up, just like any other kid, we, we wanted to be out. I'm one of five and we wanted to be outside, my brothers, my sister and I, and we wanted to go to places where we could have fun. You know, growing up, the west side, the piers that existed were not the places where kids wanted to be. There was definitely a lot of decay on, the, on this riverfront, and really the city was turning its back on the waterfront, which is this, you know, amazing resource. And there was the, you know, the elevated West Side Highway, um, which was in poor condition, and it actually, a section of it had collapsed at one point. There were plans to build a sort of a subsurface highway running under underground called Westway. That didn't happen for a variety of reasons and, and lawsuits, but that, I think that indirectly made the city and state and realize that this is this amazing resource, this undervalued resource. And there is just a return to New York, you know, a, a, you know, just a general urban renaissance. And we have this amazing opportunity here that needs to be taken advantage of. It started with the, you know, the reconstruction of the West Side Highway into kind of a, a promenade. Uh, a bikeway was built and the promenade was built. And there was always a master plan from the very beginning of the start of Hudson River Park Act that showed what was gonna be on the site. Hudson River Park is such a special place. We have this amazing collection of old uh, shipping piers that have been redesigned to open up the waterfront, to allow people to uh, have spaces for active and passive recreation. And, and not only that, but the commitment of Hudson River Park is to protect this 400-acre marine sanctuary. And so it's this wonderful place of enjoyment uh, for people to go and play and, and also to learn, uh, to learn about the ecology. Hudson River Park has seen impressive growth in the past year, with several piers under construction and the opening of the iconic Little Island. But the first pier that was opened after a decades-long hiatus was Pier 26. Let's check this pier out. Completed in 2020, Pier 26 was a project years in the making. The 2.5 acre pier in Tribeca is centered around educating the local community about previous ecosystems that once covered the island of Manhattan. Pier 26 also incorporates a sunny lawn, 
four courts, a multi-level deck, and an abundance of seating options. Let's hear about how the project got started from the architects. It's not so easy as being handed a project. We were part of a number of individuals who responded to an RFP, a request for proposal, and were selected to come and interview for this project. One of the basic tenets for this park was to celebrate its location in the Hudson River estuary. Excuse me, hold on, for the audience, uh, what's an estuary? We're actually situated in an estuary, which are just environments where salt and fresh water meet and mix together, creating a really biodiverse environment. Exactly what I thought. So it naturally has not just ecological overtones, but you are submerged in messages of ecology and sustainability when you walk onto this pier. We wanted to do something dramatic and bold. So our initial ideas were to do something organic and we came up with a squid. The long fin inshore squid is a squid that's indigenous to the Hudson River. Uh, it's only about six inches long, so it's very small but it was a great form for the pier in that it had tentacles. So those tentacles become walkways uh, that could engage the water and, and get you above the water to provide different views. And it was also something very imageable from the city side. As you walk through the park, you can see there's something for everyone. But in a city with so many opinions, that's not always an easy thing to accomplish. These things take a long time to conceptualize, to work with the community, to bring them on board. Remember, this is New York City. And I will say, anytime you work in New York City, they want 10 pounds of goods and a five pound bag. It sounds easy to say, well, let's build open space. Everyone will be happy. But in fact, everybody has different desires about what, what type of open space they like to have. I often say you can go into a room of 100 people and you'll come out with 150 opinions. And so how do we utilize all this information, all these desires from the public uh, to try to create something that uh, represents uh, the people of the city and gives everyone the opportunity to have their little piece of, of the park. First model and design really looked more like the tentacles of a squid hanging out over the water, all of which was very ambitious, but something that the Army Corps of Engineers does not like you to do, which is to hang things out into the waterway. So it changed. <laughs> so it went from this really fun squid idea to something a little bit more real and a little less squid-like and a little bit very much more architectural, I guess you could say. And I, I think the one thing that really did continue from the initial squid idea was something, some sort of form or shape that would go from one end of the pier uh, at the entry on the, on the city side, all the way to the end of the pier. And I think that's what we ended up with today was this, you know, this gigantic social deck, this gesture that goes from one end of the pier to the other, that is the, uh, the wood um, architectural piece, which is just a gigantic piece of furniture that extends the length of the pier. It may look more designed now, but the types of uses that people were happy doing in some cases still are, exist as part of our completed designs here. So we work hard to create dialogue and partnership between the designers and the communities as a principal way of trying to make everybody happy, as you say. Now that they've reached a consensus, it's time to bring that vision to a reality. So when we started Pier 26 and before, this was just a giant concrete slab. It really was an eyesore in the community. So you have all these you know, skyscrapers around, these office buildings. Everyone's looking out in the Hudson River and it's a beautiful scene with this big concrete deck in the foregrounds. This is Jonathan Holden from Stephen Dubner Landscaping. He was the senior project manager for Pier 26. A lot of people think it's interesting because in third grade, 
we made a time capsule and I wrote in there that when I grew up, I wanted to be a landscape architect. I don't think in third grade, I knew what a landscape architect was. Did you know any landscape architects? No, I did not know any landscape architects. The main reason I got into landscape contracting was to help control more of the end product. You know, when we were working in the office, everything's perfectly flat and level. Everything's level in CAD. So out here, we have the challenge of dealing with all those unforeseens and those challenges and still trying to make those dreams and the ideas and the design intents of the architects come true. It's easy to look at a pier and think to yourself, this must be made of concrete and wood. That's really not the case. Because of weight restrictions, they had to be very particular about what they used to support this concrete and the soil. So Pier 26 is actually similar to a rooftop. So we have a, a weight constraint when we were working out here of about 300 pounds per square foot. So all of this fill was brought in. It consists of geofoam, soil, lightweight aggregates, and it was all graded out to provide you know, the correct depths of soil for the different trees, the different planting media. Where we're sitting right now is about four feet above the actual concrete deck. So the geofoam depth was determined by the products that went in above it. So whether it be a walkway or a, a plant bed or a concrete slab, different materials require those different depths. As you come up in elevation, you'll see that there's just more geofoam there. So like behind us here, there'll be six, seven feet of geofoam. Where we are, there may be two or three feet, depending on whether it's underneath the walkway or underneath the soil. When we're looking at weight limits, I mean, we're looking at these trees are, you know, a four inch diameter tree right now, but we're hoping they're gonna be healthy, mature trees at one point, correspondingly higher weights. So our designers really had to look at what are things going to look like in the future when, when these trees are, are fully grown, when, you know, obviously the plantings only weigh so much, so that's less of a concern. Um, but planning, planning for the future just in terms of the weight, um, also planning for change in terms of um, sea level rise and assuming this park will occasionally flood and making sure that everything that we're putting in place will stay in place and be able to survive. Superstorm Sandy definitely changed the way a lot of landscape architects and designers thought about design and, and it changed a lot of the ways that contractors had to build. At Pier 26, um, with that geofoam buildup that I mentioned, we had to strap all of those foam blocks down to the structure. So if that storm surge ever came up, the idea is that those foam blocks wouldn't float away. It's easy to walk down the gardens of this pier and think to yourself, wow, these are beautiful plants. But there was a specific design behind each plant and the area it was planted along this pier. It's an ecologically designed pier. So as you go from east to west, you're actually experiencing different shoreline habitats. And in fact, it's very similar to what the native coastline of New York City once was. So you're starting in a woodland forest, working through some grasslands, a maritime scrub, and then you end up on this incredible platform right here, which is the tide deck, where you see some coastal marshes. The plants used on Pier 26 were all native to this area at one time. I know that was one of the major goals of the design team. So 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, when Manhattan was a, a, a barren landscape, you would have seen these flowers, these perennials, these grasses here. So it became this immersive, ecological, educational transect and walk from the city to the end of the pier. So now we're on the tide deck. And the tie deck is this one of a kind feature where we have engineered a marsh, which then meets this rocky inner tidal. And the rocky inner tidal then is dotted with tide pools. They're 
these dugouts in the rock and it's where plants and animals can take root. And it's also this amazing kind of field lab for us that we're monitoring over time and bringing students down to, uh, to learn about the marsh and rocky intertidal zones. Each of these rocks has a depression in it. And within the depression, we're seeing algaes, barnacles, mussels, settling, taking root and finding this an ideal habitat. So this was designed, these rocks, they didn't have these dents by happenstance. You created these rocks for a specific purpose. Yes, we intentionally created them because this is a more quiet, hydrodynamically zone for these animals that love to live in the intertidal. We're right here on the Hudson River and we have a high tide and a low tide twice a day. Right now we're at low tide, but this water filling the tide pool allows these animals to still feed and be active. It's a great place to look for shorebirds too. Sometimes we see mallard ducks fishing in these tide pools or gulls. Uh, so it's a really good opportunity to look for a local wildlife. You really can't see this in many other places in New York City, particularly not in Manhattan. So it's really one of a kind in that sense that this is, this is where you can see a salt marsh in Lower Manhattan. And how difficult was it to recreate that salt marsh uh, here in, on this pier? It's definitely a feat of engineering, right? <laughs> <laughs> I bet it was so simple for the architects to create. A very complicated Lego set application and, and kind of choreography of how, how to fix these boulders based on their size and based on where their divots were and how large they were and where they should go on this prefabricated concrete deck. Luckily, Trevor didn't have to worry about the layout and placement. That fell on the shoulders of Dima Storinos and Jamie Kaminsky. The boulders were obtained from a quarry in upstate New York. Uh, Jamie and Dima spent a lot of time up there working with the quarry to select the size and shape of boulders that were appropriate for the project. Uh, and when they brought them down, they had to be placed. And that was something that we had to work with the, uh, with the crane operator uh, on each individual boulder to figure out where they're gonna go. And so Jamie and Dima worked uh, many weeks, uh, day and night to uh, lay out these boulders. And it was a real testament to them and its success today and uh, really turned out beautifully. It's one of the most successful locations in the pier for people to visit, look down on and really understand how the river works ecologically. Another successful area of the pier is the massive wood-clad wall that runs the length of the pier. In a search to learn more, I found myself in a very familiar place. Surprisingly, a project in Manhattan has taken me to a place I thought I knew very well, my hometown of Kalamazoo, Michigan. Despite living here for most of my life, I just discovered Studio 431, who is making a big name for itself from this small city. Studio 431 is the custom segment of our business here at Landscape Forms. We work with landscape architects to really bring their custom vision to life. Furnishings and amenities, things that don't exist uh, in a catalog. Pier 26 was a wonderful challenge in a lot of ways, uh, from you know, sort of constructing a wall that hung off the edge of a pier to the suspended lounge and swings uh, that looked out onto the water. Everything was unique. The north side wall, which is elevated, um, was created to create a microclimate. So it extends the usability of the pier through the fall and winter seasons. On paper and in the CAD models and in the design, it's just, hey, we're gonna build this wall and we're gonna put a bunch of wood on it. The first question was, well, how do we think we're gonna build this, right? So the framing, the skeleton of the wall itself. It's a 400 foot long uh, wall, right? And cladded on all sides, so. We were very cognizant about weight and design and how we were gonna actually hang it off the pier, um, how it was gonna be installed, what order it was gonna be installed, and then making sure that we had material available to make parts that big. 
you know, there's, there's so much lineup and so much fit and finish that has to be done on site that we typically get to control in our factory because of the fact that we couldn't mock up the entire project. Early on we did a kind of concept mock up of a couple sections of the wall um, in our shop, but then we switched over to using fixtures to create each individual panel because it's one large panelized system. We would just be ripping through panel after panel and then you know, sending them off to the contractor and uh, really working with them to figure out how this thing was going to get installed and looked great. So, so right here, we had, these are called the fins. Below them is a structure that holds it into the pier. Now these are originally designed to attach to the side of the pier. And to keep the design intent, but make the install a little more feasible, we actually welded arms on, which come back underneath the decking and attach from the top, right down to the concrete slab. Okay, so you wanted to make sure there's no fasteners that you could see whatsoever. Correct, so that was a, a major design goal for the design team was not to have any of the fasteners shown so everything is screwed from the back in that skeleton structure. That's one of the things we pride ourselves in is like to actually have people question how is this thing built you know how is it being held together. We worked hard at trying to figure out a way that both looked beautiful from the in-use standpoint of on the pier and then also um, from the water as well. When we put these in, there was, there was nothing else here at this point. We actually assembled a gantry system and we hung and suspended the panels over and then slipped them into place, got them at the right elevations, bolted them in, and then the decking went to them. We're really astonished at the craftsmanship of the, the installers on this project. So they're able to meet, meet our uh, quality standard you know, to a T, so that was, that was really cool. That uh, sounds like a pretty impressive engineering feat, huh? I would say it's one we don't want to do again too soon. <laughs>
In a, in a way, our parks were never more fully utilized than, than during the pandemic when people were allowed to go outside and have socially distant activities outdoors. So people really were relying on these open spaces. This was identified at the highest levels in New York State when COVID first hit. We were given exemption and we were able to keep working through COVID because it was deemed a necessity for people to be able to have more room, more space. We definitely had issues with um, suppliers and manufacturers. We had, you know, state shutdowns. Despite all those delays, you know, we were ahead of schedule and we managed to bring the project in on time and on budget. I'm proud of that. And so to be able to open this gift up to the city was fantastic. What was really cool is after the ceremony, and the park opened, people came in and they kept coming in. That has been probably one of the most gratifying moments. To see the transformation from a place where my mother wouldn't let me go to a place where all I wanna do is take my nieces and my nephews is such an incredible testament to what's been happening on Manhattan's west side through Hudson River Park. Wrapping up at Pier 26 in Lower Manhattan, I'm Ben Roberts, and this is Design vs. Build.